Hey folks, I hope you're all excited for our final module dealing with the Engaging Minds textbook. After this week, you won't have any more assigned readings from me and we'll just be focusing on your final products and your final reflection. So for the last time this semester, let's get philosophical. So this week we're talking about systemic sustainability education, which is the final moment in Engaging Minds. And it is an interesting one to discuss considering everything that's currently going on in the world right now. The author set up this moment in Engaging Mind by mentioning some of the crises um, that we're facing, such as climate change, species extinction, um, ocean acidification, um, global epidemics, and of course now a uh, global pandemic. And these issues have roots in um, our, some of our deep set beliefs about the relationship between humans and other species and just the world in general. So these crises are a result of the beliefs that the planet is an exploitable resource that we're disconnected from. So here humans are placed in a privileged dominating role despite the fact that we are just one species of many. And as someone with a background in nursing, I really like this moment because it goes beyond looking at things just like individual experiences, cultural norms, and um, power dynamics. So when I first went into research, I worked in medical sociology, predominantly which is very concerned with things like power dynamics. And while I really, really enjoyed it and found it very insightful, uh, I was constantly asked, left with questions about, you know, what about the physical world? What about biology? Because of course, in nursing and health science more broadly, biology is pretty central to what we do, but it was kind of absent from the kind of research we were doing. So we get more into these kinds of issues when we're discussing systemic sustainability education. So without further delay, let's go back to our epistemology tree and take a look at what's going on in this moment. So today we're on the last branch of our epistemology tree. So we're continuing on the physical branch, but now we're going to jump over to the interobjectivity branch. And this is quite different from the idea of objectivity that we talked about um, in standardized education when we were talking about Descartes and Bacon. So we're not talking about universal truths here. Here the world is seen as consisting of dynamic relationships and not things or eternal ideas. Uh, so things, processes, um, living systems are all things that emerge through effective interaction and they emerge at multiple levels. So think back to the nested system that I introduced um, in week two. So these can range from cellular to people, societies, and ecosystems. And there are two branches on the interobjectivity branch, complexity science and ecology. And we're going to be talking more about complexity science this week, but I will touch on ecology a bit. And both of these branches are concerned with humans, culture, and the more than human biological and ecological worlds and how they're all interconnected. And in both, knowing is seen as continually emerging between these constantly changing relationships. So let's start with complexity science. So complexity science emerged in the 1980s like many great things, and it views the world as consisting of ever-changing and interconnected complex adaptive system, ranging from cellular to ecological. And complexity science is often described as a transdisciplinary or holistic approach to describing the behavior of complex systems as a whole and as their um, interacting component parts. And this goes beyond what we were discussing in democratic citizenship education because it's recognizing not only the social but also the biological role within knowing, learning, and teaching. And it's a pretty complex theory, pun intended. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking about what a complex system is not. Namely, it is not a simple or a complicated system, which Engaging Minds didn't talk about simple systems, but it did talk a little bit about complicated systems. So the main difference between a simple system and a complicated system is just the number of component parts. So a simple system has very few. And these can be um, analyzed using Newtonian science, so um, reductionism. So put simply, we can understand simple and complicated systems by taking them apart. Uh, for example, you can understand how a pocket watch works by taking it apart. And their behavior is linear, which means we can make predictions when we're dealing with a simple or a complicated system. Although it is more complicated with complicated systems, as the name implies. Um, so in this area, accuracy can be a little bit more of a challenge. However, this reductionist approach that we like to use to understanding systems doesn't work with everything, uh, particularly systems that are more complex. Yet we often use this approach because it's very simple. So the complexity of the human body, for example, in classrooms and societies can't be fully understood by reducing them to their component parts because their behaviors are emerging from these parts interacting. So we ourselves are complex adaptive systems. So I, for example, can't be understood by reducing myself to my component parts. So I'm more than just a sack of organs. So I am more than just the sum of my parts. Yet in healthcare, we often use this mechanical metaphor of the body. So the human body being like a machine. And as I'm sure many of you in healthcare know, it's health isn't that simple. But as many of us are in healthcare are aware, there are a lot of other systems or factors that will influence health and well-being, uh, such as um, social and economic. 
and it, this influence can be rather unpredictable. So we can't reduce health and wellness, or in the experience of it indeed, by just reducing the human body to its component parts. Because when we reduce a um, complex system like our bodies just to down to its component parts, we actually destroy the complexity that we're trying to study. And the same goes with classrooms. We can't understand the complexity of a classroom at a community level by just breaking it down into each of our individual learners because a lot of things are going to emerge at the collective level when the different students are interacting with one another. And these are the types of systems that complexity science is dealing with. So some other examples would be organ systems, immune systems, um, you yourself as a person, uh, the communities and si societies that you are a member of, um, even the ecosystem. There's some literature um, within the realm of HPE that talks about um, family practices as an example of complex adaptive systems. And so in complexity science, we're really seeking to look at the behavior of a system as a whole, as well as also looking at the individual components that make up that system and give rise to it. And complexity science, or complexivists, as you'll sometimes hear them called, understand these adaptive and self-organizing systems as being learning systems. So learning is understood as being this elaborative, ongoing um, co-evolution with the environment as a system maintains its coherence within its internal and external world. So another example of a CAS would be your immune system. So when your body encounters a new microbe or a germ, uh, your body learns, hopefully, how to mount a uh, successful defense against it should you encounter it again in the future. So this is an example of your immune system learning. And the same kind of thing works with immunizations. So you can kind of see immunizations as being like sending your immune system to school. Speaking of which, get your flu shot if you can. And in this moment, I like to use the term knowing rather than knowledge. And you probably noticed in some of my other videos that I often will talk about knowing rather than knowledge. And this because knowledge in complexity science isn't seen as being a thing and it isn't about finalized truth because it's co about this constant co-evolution that's going on. So here knowing is a dynamic flow between systems as well as their agents that are comprising them. And knowing is also more of a tool that we can use to engage with our world. And here, I can't remember if it was engaging minds or inventions of teaching that talked about this, but learning and knowing are kind of the same thing in this moment. And this is because of that um, continual evolution that's going on. So here in complexity science, we're not talking about finalized truths, but rather knowledge and knowing as being provisional. So it changes. And then the second branch on the interobjectivity branch is ecology. And granted, this isn't one that I know as much about in terms of um, education. I have picked up some from studying complexity science and doing some of these readings. And honestly, I've probably learned more about uh, ecology in this vein of thought from learning about food production and veganism and things like that, but uh, I will do my best here. And ecology is pretty similar to complexity science, but the major defining thing would be um, that Ecology is more concerned about ethical know-how and ethical action, whereas complexity science is more practical know-how. And in Davis's um, Inventions of Teaching, he talks about deep ecology. My understanding of this area is that it reframes how we look at environmental discourses. So a lot of them predominantly frame our relationship to the more than human world in terms of managing and overseeing the environment. But within deep ecology, all life forms are seen as being inherently valuable. So our role here isn't about management and overseeing the environment, but rather about mindfully engaging in the world. As as well as ethical action. So within this vein of thought, we are considered to have the right to draw on the Earth's um, natural resources, but only to satisfy vital needs. And a major movement in this area is trying to move towards a more uh, region-appropriate lifestyle and production activities. So like the 100-mile diet, uh, for example, where you try to eat foods that are produced within 100 miles of where you live. So it's considered to be a more sustainable diet, although it would be very difficult depending on where you live. So here, mindful participation in the unfolding of personal and collective identities, culture, and intercultural space and the biosphere is very important and knowing focuses on the implications of our knowing and our actions for all life not just humans and inventions of teaching talks about some really neat areas within ecology which i didn't know a whole lot about until i read that book uh, for example eco psychology which believes that there's a lot of widespread feelings of personal isolation and collective dysfunction that are rooted in our separation from nature so eco psychologists work to reconnect their clients with nature and another is ecofeminism, which argues that not only are a lot of our worldviews very um, human dominant, they're also very male dominant. And ecofeminism points out that a lot of the beliefs and structures that oppress women also oppress nature. 
So ecofeminists and deep ecologists argue that a lot of our anti-oppression discourses, such as what we talked about in democratic citizenship education, should also include nature in addition to race, class, gender, and sexuality. And some authors call this eco-justice. So here teaching can be understood as conversing, uh, which comes from the Latin for living together. And teaching is not only about ethical engagement, but also fostering mindfulness in ourselves and in our students. Now, as we've discussed previously, the evolution of education doesn't stop with this last moment. This is just where the author saw us as being currently at when they published this book. And I would argue right now with the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, um, the increased discussion we're having about um, racial inequality, especially with regards to Aboriginal people in Canada, I would argue that we are on the cusp of a fifth moment. And I think digital technology um, will be one thing that will play a much greater role in the next moment. So while Engaging Minds in the fourth moment does talk a bit about technology, which I'll talk more about in my Getting Practical video, I think right now more than ever digital technology is extremely important to education. Uh, not only do we have a lot of online programs like the one that you're taking currently, but with the pandemic we also have a lot of children that are now doing online learning. And from talking to a lot of parents that have their children currently doing um, online education, and as someone who teaches solely online and actually did so before the pandemic, uh, E-learning is not easy, folks. While there's a lot of really great things about it, there are also a lot of challenges. An actor network theory, which I think Engaging Minds mentions very briefly, uh, is something I could see being more prominent in the next moment. So actor network theory is an approach um, that's used to describe everything in the natural and social world, including but not limited to people, other living creatures, organizations, objects like technology, and geographical arrangements, as all existing within a complicated and shifting network of relationships. So in actor network theory, human and material elements are treated as equals, and they're all seen as being actors that influence how effective practices and social networks are formed, and thus what counts as knowledge. So when the fourth edition of Engaging Mind comes out, is it going to open saying that the fifth moment started in 2020? What do you think? And what else would you like to see in a fifth moment? And that's all for now, folks. Uh, if you have any questions about this moment or even just questions uh, generally about grad school, um, please do let me know. Quite a few of you emailed me saying you really enjoyed my video on tips for grad school. So if there's any other topics like that you want me to cover, please do let me know. And I hope you found this video to be a helpful primer for talking about complexity science and ecology and just systemic sustainability education in general within your groups. And as always, I will see you all online. Bye.